So uh, how is everything? Last time we spoke, we were talking about maybe going to Bantamweight and challenge for the title. I think like yeah. two weeks later, like a week and a half later, you got a fight announced. So uh, how how has everything been going, getting ready for uh, Singapore? Everything's been going great. Um, yeah, like soon after that, I got the offer to fight Talia again. Um, and I was definitely down for it, obviously. Flyweight's my weight, so I, I, I like staying here um, and working my way up from here. Um, but yeah, camp's been great. I leave Saturday for Singapore and uh, yeah, I'm super excited. So I, I, I obviously, I like this fight. You had it before when everything fell apart and you ended up fighting Jessica Andrade. Um, but I love the idea of you going to 135 and challenge for the title. I thought that was like the reason I reached out to interview. I was like, I love that idea. I think it's a fantastic idea. You're not the kind of person that strikes me as like you're going to sit around and like cry over spilled milk. Was there just like the slightest party, like a little disappointment didn't happen, or did you move on pretty quickly? I, I moved on pretty quickly, especially when I got offered another fight. Um, obviously, that was something that was kind of up in the air. So I would have been that would have been an awesome opportunity. Um, but you never know what opportunities come down the road. And I know as long as I keep winning, uh, big opportunities like that could open up. So yeah, it was just from one possibility to the next, and now this is solidified and I'm excited about this one. Can I ask in all honesty though, like obviously that didn't happen and, and your pursuit now is the flyaway title. And we have to imagine, you know, you're right on the cusp of that title shot. I think a lot of people would argue if not for the whole Alexa Grasso upset, you would have been fighting for the title. Of course um, is 135 something you could still pursue down the road. Like, do you see a day maybe like, you know, four or five years from now where bantamweight could be another division you would explore. I could see it in, in the, in the future. For sure. Like if I'm, I, I would really like to stay at Flyway right now and win that title and solidify myself there, but I definitely wouldn't write it off. Um, I think, I think, yeah, I, I feel like at 25 or 35, I, I could be pretty much anybody and win that title. Um, definitely at Flyway and possibly at 35 too. I mean, see how my body changes and stuff uh, as I get older, but um, yeah, maybe it's a possibility in the future. I mean, being a two division champion is a cool thing. And I, I, I don't, I don't imagine you'd ever want to cut to 115. So I think 135 would probably be a better option. Yeah, no, I wouldn't be making 15 anytime soon. Um, 25 for sure. And yeah, maybe 35. Yeah. So when you got the call for Tyler Santos, like, I feel like I know you well enough to say that, like, you don't really turn down fights. You don't turn down opportunities, but of course the last one in February, I believe it was, um, it wasn't because of an injury. It wasn't, it was because from my understanding, it was issues with like her team getting into the country, all that kind of stuff happened. And then obviously you ended up getting Jessica on draws on pretty short notice. Was there any hesitation or question to say like, are we sure she's going to show up? Because when a fighter gets injured, like this, and that's part of the sport, everyone deals with that, but that was such a weird one. Was there any like slight concern? Like, Hey, is she actually going to show up this time? Like, is she going to be able to get in the country? Like, were any of those questions asked when you got this offer? I definitely did think about that at first. Um, but I know with the loophole with Singapore is you don't need a visa to get in. So I knew, and she has fought there prior. So I know she's done it. She's gotten there. She's got all her corners that she wanted there. Um, and with having, without having to get a visa, it makes it a, a lot easier of a process. So once I knew that, um, I was pretty confident that she'd show up. I, I knew that it wasn't really any other reason and not, that wasn't a great reason either for sure. But, um, but I, I definitely think she's going to show up this time. Um, so she, cause it's been so long since she's fought. Um, and if she wants to stay relevant, she should show up. And on the flip side of that though, it does require you to travel all the way to Singapore. I mean, obviously, you know, you're, I mean, it's, you know, there's an opportunity to fight somewhere different and all those things, but that really does affect you. I mean, you have to fly halfway around the world. You're flying out in like two days to go to Singapore, which means you're going to be there for basically two weeks of getting ready. Were you like, were, was there any party that's like embracing this opportunity to go to Singapore? Or were you like, man, I really don't want to fly halfway around the world for a fight. Cause I know there's two sides to every fight. Like there's some excitement, but also like, I'm sure you'd probably rather fight in New York or Boston, you know what I mean? Like that would be even better because you're, you know, shorter travel from the East Coast. I don't know. How did you feel about that when they said, hey, Tyler Santos, oh, by the way, you're flying to Singapore? Yeah, you know, I was definitely always one of those people. I was like, oh, I'd rather like fight in Vegas all the time or fight right by home, like New York or Boston. I'd love to fight in Boston too one day. Um, but, you know, I, I knew at some point in my UFC career that I would have to fly somewhere and fight. Um, so so when, when they told me Singapore, I wasn't completely shocked. And uh, you know, I'm happy it's it's happening at this point in my career because I can afford to fly out early and make sure I do everything right. 
Um, and, you know, I think at this point, I've, I've definitely embraced it. I'm excited to see Singapore. Um, I've actually looked into uh, like looked into things that I want to go see while I'm out there. Um, got a gym like set up that I'm going to go train at. So at this point, I, I've definitely fully embraced it. I feel like I got everything set to go. Um, yeah, and I'm excited to go see a part of the world I probably would have never seen if it wasn't for fighting. Um, yeah, so I'm excited about it. And obviously, I mean, listen, you, you, it sounds like you set things up. You mentioned you have a gym to train at. You're going over there early. Cause we've heard a lot of horror stories of guys and girls who don't do that. They travel over like right before the fight, they deal with jet lag. They deal with just being tired. I mean, I, I flew from Ohio to California last month to go to uh, San Diego and even just that one day and three hours difference, like I was just dragging ass for like the rest of the day. You know what I mean? So like, it's a real thing when you're traveling like that. So it sounds like you do have everything set up to ensure that that doesn't happen. Oh yeah. I'm definitely set up so that doesn't happen. Cause I know it's literally like a 12 hour time difference from where I live. So I know that first week, like probably that whole first week um, that I'm there, I'll be adjusting, but I know once fight week comes, I'll be completely adjusted and ready to go. Yeah. And, and does it make it easier? I don't want to say easier, but like, does it make it better that you did spend an entire training camp getting ready for Tyler Santos? I mean, we have to remember, you have to, we have to remind ourselves that the Jessica Andrade fight came together. What on like a week's notice or whatever it was super short notice. So you spent your entire training camp getting ready for Tyler and then you had to switch to Jessica Andrade. So in a weird way, do you feel like you spent now, I would imagine, what, like 12, 13 weeks total training to get ready for one opponent, basically? Yeah, because even for my last fight, like seven out of the eight weeks, because I always do like eight-week camps, were spent training for Talia. Um, and then this whole camp, obviously, is spent training for Talia. Uh, so I definitely have had a lot of time uh, training for her. Um, you know, I feel like there was maybe a couple adjustments that we made this time that we thought uh, we could add in. And, um, yeah, you know, I mean, I feel like even when I, when I train for any opponent, I'm, I'm focused on what I want to improve and what I want to uh, do better than I did in the last fight. So I've been working on that, going over the things we already, um, wanted to do, uh, when we were going to fight Talia. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I definitely feel more than prepared for this opponent. Yeah. Every, every fight you have in the UFC is a, what I like to call a measuring stick, you know, where you get to find out where you're at and where you belong. And I think a lot of people, myself included, when you arrived in the UFC, I said, Aaron Blanchfield's going to be a contender. She's going to be a champion, but you still had to go out there and prove it. When you fought Jessica Andrade, I think you answered a lot of those questions. And a lot of people became a believer in Aaron Blanchfield in that moment, because we all know how good Jessica Andrade is. Tyler Santos was a little diverse. She didn't really have a resume. And then she kind of got drawn into the Valentina Shevchenko fight at the time. No knock on her, but let's be honest. It was because Valentina had kind of run through everybody else. Like Tyler wasn't like the number one ranked fighter and everyone was itching to see that fight. She was just kind of like there because everyone else had beat her. Then she goes in and has a really good performance against Valentina. Like, wow. Like she actually was, you know, super good. Had super close. So I took her to a split decision, all those kind of things. Do you look at Tyler Santos as a great measuring stick because of that one fight or because it's kind of hard to judge her, right? Because she was good. Don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking her. as not a good fighter, but I don't think anyone, myself included, would have seen that fight with Valentina and said she's going to take Valentina Shevchenko to a split decision. I thought Valentina would just, you know, dominate like she always had. And Tyler surprised me in that fight. Yeah, you know, I feel like at this level, um, finding people in the top five, they're all, I guess, measuring sticks, as you say, or like, they're all so tough and they're all tough in their own ways. And they have different styles that I, I know what I can do. And I know I can go in there and beat them. Um, and I feel like for myself, I already know that I can, it's just kind of like what you said, like you just have to go in there and prove it. And, um, I'm going to prove it every single time until I get that title and then hold it as long as I want. Yeah. Now I always, I, it's so weird because when you're at this level, like when this fight was made back in February, Everyone looked at it and said, well, this is a national number one contenders fight because Tyler was just coming off the title and you were obviously coming up the ranks. Um, beating Jessica Andrade was, you know, arguably even bigger win just because she was more established as a veteran. But now you're getting this one back to back. Can I ask, like, obviously the goal is the title, but you're so young. You just turned 24, right? Like you, you literally are like, you have so much time in front of you. Of course, we know like a month after your fight, or actually, no, I'm sorry, a month, a week after your fight, we got. Rose Nama Yunus making her debut of flyweight against Mano Fior. And a lot of people thought maybe you would fight Mano. Can I ask, like, are you looking at Tyler Santos as a number one contenders fight and you get the winner of Grasso and Shevchenko? Or are you just kind of like letting the chips fall where they may, knowing that 
You know, Mandela's fighting Rose. Let's be honest. Rose, a former champion. She's gotten a lot of opportunity. We can't lie and say she doesn't, you know, she doesn't have a name. Like, how are you approaching this fight? Is this a number one contenders fight or is this just a fight? And you'll kind of see where the chips fall afterwards. For me, this is just a fight and I'll, I'll see how it goes after. I know that um, the Manone versus Rose fight is obviously a huge fight too for the division. Um, I'd love to fight the winner of that fight, win my fight and fight the winner. Um but I'd also want to put on a great performance in my fight because I know the better performance is the, the the way you win these fights too is also going to lead to your next opportunity. Like if I go in there and I knock Kelly out first round, it's like they're going to want to see me fight for a title versus if it's like a hard fought, like split decision. And then Rose and Manone is a great fight. Then they might get it over us. Or maybe, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen with the title. Um, Valentina could win and they do a trilogy and then uh, I win my fight. Whoever wins that fight, fight each other in the meantime. So there's so many possibilities. And if I've learned anything from fighting, you have absolutely no idea what's next. You just know it's in front of you and you need to put a thousand percent into that and um, let the chips fall as they may and figure it out after the fight. So um, I'm a hundred percent focused on Talia. She's super tough in her own right. And I plan on finishing her and then seeing what happens. You you kind of you kind of strike me as the like speak softly and carry a big stick kind of person because every time you go out there, you impress with your performance. It's like going into the Molly McCann fight. She had all the hype. She had two big knockouts in a row. Everyone's kind of buzzing about her. And then I mean, no offense, but you laid waste to her. It was just you know you absolutely demolished her. And then going into Jessica Andrade, like oh man, this is such a big step up. This is a great fight. And it I mean, it was a great fight. It was a one sided fight, but it was a great. Fight. You know, you you pretty much went in there and steamrolled her. So. You go out there and do that to Tyler Santos, you know, that does make the statement you want to make. Like, we don't really need to talk about it. You go out there and, and stomp a mud hole in Tyler Santos. Uh, that does all the talking you need, right? Oh, it definitely does. I feel like whatever happens next, if it's another fight, title, whatever, like, I'm going to keep proving that I deserve that title every single fight. And I feel like that's, like, my biggest focus, like, just doing better and finishing my opponents um, and making the fights as smooth as possible, taking least damage. Like, that's everything I'm kind of focused on. and. Everything else will come when you do that. We we are all guilt. I'm guilty of it, Aaron. I fully admit it. We're guilty of playing the what if game because we always love <laughs> talking about like what if this happens? What if this happens? You just mentioned it though. You're in a three round fight. Obviously, Mano and Rose are a three round fight. We know the title fights five rounds. We know title fights. Do people make quick turnarounds? Yeah, Aljamain Sterling did it. He fought in May in five rounds. He turned around. He's fighting you know next week in Boston, but that's still a rarity. It doesn't often happen like that. You mentioned it, and again, I know we're playing the what if game here, but you know if Alexa, if Alexa and, and then Valentina go five hard rounds, I I don't know. Maybe the winner won't fight again until twenty twenty four. It sounds like you would be okay if that's the scenario. And you have to fight the winner of Mendo and Rose. Like you're okay with that. Is that is that fair to say? That's definitely fair to say. Um, Cause like I said, like you never know what's going to happen and I'd rather fight um, instead of waiting for something, especially if it's like a long period of time. Uh, I'd like to have my full camp and everything, but I know that sometimes title fights can take a while to come around. Like you said, if they fight five rounds and they're both beat up, uh, it might be a while. So they have to fight again. Um, so I definitely be open to fighting the winner of that. Yeah. Now I know this is kind of an impossible question to answer, but I love asking for, I know in your spare time when you're not fighting and mauling people in the UFC, uh, you've done commentary, you've done analysis, and I'd love to get your take on fights and division. I know this is a tough one because Rose is coming up to 125 and you're always, I'm always curious how fighters adapt. We've seen people be very successful at it. Alexa Grasso is a great example of that. We've also <laughs> seen some struggles because you are dealing with the size difference and reach and things like that. So just on like an outsider's perspective, how do you see Mano and Rose playing out? Because it is an interesting matchup. Mano, very high-level grappler, but we've seen her, I won't say struggle, but she's had some issues a little bit with grappling, you know, a little bit in a couple fights. Rose, high-level grappler, and actually is a really good striker, but she's coming up to 125. How is she going to deal with the size? So I know it's a tough one, but can you give me a little bit of thought on how you see that one playing out or how you expect it to play out? Yeah, you know, I, I was definitely surprised when I saw Rose come up. I know she's talked about it, but like, like we have some people who have success coming up. Like, uh, obviously, like Alexa's come up for fifteen, but I know Alexa's also like missed weight at fifteen, and she was ha like struggling to make weight. So that kind of makes sense that she moved up because um, she's obviously still cutting weight to make twenty five, and fifteen was kind of becoming impossible. Where for someone like um, Rose, it seems like fifteen was pretty easy. She was never someone that struggled on the scale, someone that missed weight. 
So her coming up doesn't really make sense to me. And I don't know if she had the actual size, like Alexa kind of grew into that size where I don't know if Rose um, really has. I know she hasn't fought in a while, so maybe she was able to kind of put on some muscle, but I don't know if she's really going to feel or look like a natural 125er if um, 15 was something she's always made and she's already older and she was still relatively easy for her to make. Um, I feel like Manone is, and then Manone's a big 125er. Like she's someone that probably cuts a good amount of weight. She's a tall girl. She's a striker. Um, I know her ground's probably not the best, but I don't know if Rose is going to have the, the, the wrestling to get her down. And, um, I don't think she's going to have striker either. I think she's going to, I think Manone's going to have that length on her. I think Manone's, uh, takedown defense will be enough to kind of keep, stay away from there. But Rose is a, one of the best, um, to ever do it. So you never know. She could like she would have to try to create a scramble in my mind in order to like maybe get some Manone's back or something. Um, but I just don't know if she's gonna be able to do it. I don't know if she's gonna be able to deal with uh, Manone's reach um and then just her overall size. Yeah, Rose is kind of a wiry straw weight, you know what I mean? Like she was never yeah. like a big muscular, big, you know, straw weight. So yeah, it is. I mean, listen, I mean, I think Joanna Young Jacek one of the greatest uh, fighters in history, but when she came up, we saw her struggle against Valentina. Now going, there's no shame in struggling against Valentina, but you know, the things she could do at straw weight did not work as well at, in that fight with flyweight. And so you have to wonder like, will it work? And cause like you said, she was not a big straw weight that, I mean, that's a real thing. Like size matters. Oh, size definitely matters. Like if she was like, let's say she was struggling every time to make weight or it was like an uphill battle or she was missing weight, then I would totally get it. Cause now like you're, you truly should be in the upper weight class, but if your weight cuts are relatively easy and they're going smooth and you're making it and you're making it healthfully, um, I don't really see a reason to move up. Yeah. Now we had a little bit of this chat when we talked a few, a couple of months ago about you going to bands away and I kind of mentioned the uh, flyweight title fight. Of course, now we are only a couple weeks removed from that. Um, I asked you before, but I want to ask you again, Alexa Grasso, Valentina too. Again, can I ask you how you see that one playing out? And and do you see it going any differently? I know Alexa has said, you know, she wants to prove it wasn't a fluke. She wants to prove people that it wasn't a fluke. And for Valentina, you know, suddenly people are saying maybe she dropped off. Maybe she's lost a step. Maybe she's, uh, you know, every like time waits for no man or however they want to say it. Like everyone has that moment. Has your opinion changed at all? Do you see it playing out any differently? Because again, that's a big moment for your division, uh, and it you know in some ways does affect your future because obviously you want that title. Yeah, you know, so everyone's been asking me, and I feel so torn because I was so wrong the first time. Um, Alexa had a great game plan um, and implemented it perfectly on Valentina. Um, you know, I think Valentina was winning that fight. She definitely looked a little tired, and I don't know. I mean, she is getting older, so maybe she isn't um, exactly what she used to be, and time is only it keeps moving. So, um, I'm not really sure if that was the case or, um, what exactly happened, but she, I, I feel like Alexa has such a good game plan. I feel like she'll keep, and she always adjusts too. I think that's what makes Alexa a little more dangerous than Valentina. I feel like Valentina is a little stubborn and does the exact same things every fight. So I could see her losing if she doesn't uh, adjust her game, but if she adjusts slightly and kind of stays winning the fight the way she did the first time I could see her winning, but I'm completely torn. I'm not sure what's going to happen. Um, I can see either girl winning. Yeah, it's tough because, you know, going, I listen, I was with you. I was with everybody. I thought that Valentina was just going to win again. I mean, that's what she does. And, and I actually thought that Tyler Santos was more of a fluke. Uh, and then, you know, Alexa's, uh, you know, she seized on an opening, seized on a mistake and, 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 and made the most of it. Uh, it's always weird though. Right. Because you never know, like, is, is like, it has Valentina, you know, has the time maybe finally caught up to Valentina, or, or or was it that? Like, was it a fluke? Was it just one mistake and she sees on it? Like, that's the fascinating thing about this fight. It it definitely is. Um, you know, she was definitely winning. It was it was a hard win. I mean, she was taking her down and she was trying to hold her. Um, it was, definitely wasn't easy. That's why I know maybe Alexa could adjust and maybe do a little bit better. But so can Valentina. So you don't you don't really know. Um, and like you said, it could just be the day. I mean, they're gonna fight again. See, it's a new day, a new. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I really have no idea, um, but I'm definitely excited to see how it goes. Yeah, it's fascinating because you wonder, like, you know, is Valentina still the best in the world? Can she redo it? I mean, we saw it with Amanda Nunes and Juliana Pena. Juliana Pena pulled off a big upset, and then Amanda really got fired up and then came back. And, you know, no offense to Juliana, but she got to beat the brakes off her in that rematch. Uh, you wonder how much fire is in Valentina now. Like, is she that level of fired up or... You know, is this kind of like the passing of the torch? Like, you know, because I think you coming in, when you came in and Casey O'Neill and some of the other younger fighters were like the next generation of flyweights, 
Um, and now it's kind of crazy. We started with bantamweight in the women's divisions in the UFC. Then they added straw weight. Now I think flyweight's the best division in women's MMA. Like it's crazy for the longest time. Valentina was just kind of like ruling over the division, but now we can't say that. Like we've got you, we've got Alexa, we've got, you know, Tyla, we've got a Mano, Rose coming up. Like I think flyweight's the best division in, in all of women's MMA right now. Oh, I, I totally agree. I feel like, Honestly, I feel like with Valentina losing, it made it so interesting. Um, and then obviously Amanda left 35, so there's nobody at 35. Uh, at 15, it's kind of like same couple girls, but at 25, there's so many like new people that are still like kind of yet to prove themselves. I think that's what makes it very interesting. And then you have vets like Valentina and Grasso that are still at the top. So I think there's just so many different things going on and nobody knows who's going to fight for the title. Nobody knows who's going to win this rematch. And it makes it super interesting and um, definitely puts a lot of hype behind the 125. Let me, let me ask you this last question before I let you go, Aaron. You know, there's a lot of people we, you know, we do rankings at MMA fighting and I'm, I'm not going to name names, but there's a couple people in the rankings who already have you as the best flyweight in the world. You don't have the title yet, but we believe you are the best flyweight in the world. Do you like, I know you don't pay attention to that in the terms of like, you know, you get your head big and your ego blows up or anything like that, but do you appreciate the people have already recognized your talent and see you as that. Like you may not have the title yet, but there's already people, uh, <clears throat> myself included who have you ranked as the best flyweight in the world. Like, do you appreciate that compliment? Like, even though you don't have the belt, like a lot of people are looking at you, not only as the future, but like, we already believe you are the best. Like there's people who believe you are the best right now. Yeah, no, I definitely do appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I always like that's, that was always the goal. And I love that people think that, about me too. I feel like that kind of, it makes me want to go out there and prove them. Right. Um, you know, I mean, since my first, since I was a kid, I wanted to be a champ and, um, nothing's changed and I've always had my eye on that. Um, and uh, yeah, it's nice that the other people seeing the same thing. Absolutely. Well, Aaron, I can't wait for this fight. Obviously safe travels over to Singapore. Uh, can't wait to see you back in action, obviously. And thank you as always for taking the time, especially with travel coming up in a couple of days and, uh, let's catch up after another big win. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Absolutely. We'll talk soon. Yeah, I'll talk soon.